So last week, we started talking about sin. And we spent about half the class uh, doing a, a Q&A from the last few weeks. And then we started uh, the, our discussion of sin. And sin's a, uh, you know, it's a big subject. There's just no getting around the fact that it's a big subject within Christianity, specifically. But it's also an unpopular subject. In modern Christianity, it's very unpopular. And I don't know, really, if you were to look back four or five hundred years ago and say, was it unpopular to talk about them? But at the very least, it is not one of the first things you want to bring up around churchgoers or not churchgoers or anyone in between. It's, it's really not. Um, now, that isn't to say that people don't do that, but it is to say that the majority of people do not like to have it brought up to them. They don't like to hear about it. They don't like to be confronted with it. And we talked about a little bit of why, and this is me kind of recapping a little bit from last week. But we live in a very postmodern culture. Not explicitly postmodern, but very definitely implicitly postmodern. In other words, our standards of morality are very much relative. We have a relative view. Okay, well, what's right for me is what's right for me. And don't you dare question my way of life. Don't you dare tell me that this is wrong or that I should be doing something else. And so why does sin not jive well with that problem? At the very least, whatever sin is exactly, it represents a clear standard of right and wrong. And any kind of clear standard of right and wrong does not go well with postmodernism. It just doesn't. And therefore, it doesn't go well with this culture. And so people come into a church for the first time, and if you're out there telling them, you shouldn't be doing this, and it's something that they're doing, they're not going to like to hear it. First blush. Now, there's going to be some people who are inspired to change. You know what? You're right. I shouldn't be doing that. But there's a lot of people who will say, forget you. you need it. I don't need to listen to this. I'm living my life the way it works for me. It represents a standard. And we don't like a standard. And so we talked about that a little bit. Uh, and then we stopped because we only had about half a class time to start looking at it. So we're going to continue from what we left off. Then. Let's take a, a step back. We don't like to talk about it. It's not fun to talk about unless you're one of those street evangelists screaming about how people are going to burn in hell unless they turn to Jesus Christ. That is not me saying it's right or wrong. I don't like it. But it's not me saying whether it's right or wrong. Maybe you agree with it. Whatever. Um, but at the very least, we don't really like to talk about it, and we don't really like to have it talked at us, especially when it's confronting things that we need to change. Uh, but once again, let's take a step back here. Should this be talked about? Sure. Yes. In, in your opinion? Yes. Okay. So you guys think it should be talked about? You think it should be talked about often or occasionally or one of the main things you talk about or how often? A side thing, a bonus thing, or mm -hmm. important I kinda, thing? I mean, you know, we say a lot about how, you know, you can't get into the nitty gritty like we're doing here mm -hmm. in school on Sunday morning, but I kind of like the way you guys present it on the Sunday morning, which is, here's what you should be doing, and if you're not doing that, maybe you want to think about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you look at the life of Jesus Christ. Yeah. You take any message ever preached, mm -hmm. and almost always, whether directly or indirectly, that references this concept. Hey, look, here's the thing you shouldn't be doing. Stop it. Start doing this instead. So, okay, uh, we should talk about it, at least to some degree, but why? In your opinion, why should we talk about it? Because it, it's what separates us from God. Okay. Sin is what separates us from God. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing. It's going to be really easy, even with this question, and any, any of the questions I ask at this point, for us to get way in over our heads already. Mm -hmm. Because, really, any way you answer the question, why should we talk about sin, it can really quickly get us into areas uh, that have been debated for 2,000 years in Christian doctrine. And so we're going to be going into those areas, um, Mm, trying not to get bogged down in different doctrinal positions or what have you, but so we can all reach an understanding of sin. But yeah, just uh, you, this is you look at sin as a concept. It's not one of those well agreed upon things in Christianity. So God is loving. That's a pretty universal thing. 
You won't find a lot of Christians that would say God is not loving. Mostly because the Bible is really, really clear that he is. It's really hard to say that he's not. Weirdly, you'll find people who don't like to talk about it because they prefer to talk about other things. The wrath of God. The judgment of God. Well, God is loving and loves all people. Well, believe if you haven't encountered someone like that, you just wait. Because I have. And it's... Are you, are you serious? Wow. Yeah. God is wrath. God is judgment. Actually, yeah. it doesn't say either of those things. It yeah. says God is love. But yeah, you know, it's not one of those things that's universally agreed upon. Uh, let's, let's ask this question. How, how does God feel about this? He hates it. Hates? Okay. He hates it. It's a strong word. Yeah. It's not a popular word. It's not very popular to talk about God hating anything. It disappoints him. Disappoints? It disappoints. We have two levels of feeling here. We have disappointment, and then we have heartbreak. So. It's not that the sin that causes that, but the fact that we are choosing sin that breaks his heart. Hmm. Because we choose sin, it breaks his heart. Is it just because of the sin in and of itself? By principle, he hates it? It's the consequences. The consequences of sin. Does he hate the consequences? The consequences. Um, he hates that it hurts us. He hates that it hurts us. Hmm. That we doubt him. That we doubt him? That we doubt him and we chose the The sin. idea of rebellion? Yeah. Now, once again, we're, we're running really, really far ahead. <laughs> and I'm going to pull us back in just okay. a second here. But at least we can start brainstorming a little bit. Jim, you were saying something? Doesn't that fall into that same concept that you talked about today with the love and wanting the best for us? Yeah. Same way as yep. if God is a jealous God. It's not yes. I think so too. Yeah. Yes. I think so too. Now, see, here's the thing it's really unpopular to talk about God hating anything today. Mm -hmm. Because <laughs> when everyone says, even non Christians, well, God is, at the very least, the Christian God is loving. And love, one of the popular definitions of love today, is acceptance. Acceptance. Now, what does it mean to accept? What is, okay, what's the difference between unconditional love and unconditional acceptance? You can't criticize what I'm doing in today's culture. It means it doesn't matter what you're doing. I accept you for what you are. So what is different between these two things? Is there a difference? You can love somebody and be disappointed in their actions. Yes. You wish that they would do something better. In the Christian sense, can you love somebody and not accept them? Mm, yes. I think what they're doing. Not accept what they're doing. That's right. And I say there's a difference between those two things. There's a difference between loving a human being and accepting their lifestyle. Yes. Hmm. So if love says, well, once again, this is a love equals acceptance. If you love me, you'd accept what I am. God loves everyone, and therefore he accepts me and doesn't criticize me or want me to change. But love in the Christian sense, we talked about this this morning, doesn't just mean a feeling, and it doesn't just mean straight up acceptance. That's a really clear thing, that love doesn't just mean acceptance, biblically speaking. It means pursuing the best, yes. or the highest good. The best good. I'm not satisfied with you being down here. I want you to be up here. Yes. Even if it's okay down here, yes. I want you to be up here instead. So the thing is, I say, okay, like, I love you, and I accept you as a human being, but you're a crack addict. Mm. Does loving them mean you have to accept their crack addiction? No. No. On the contrary, your love of them would make you feel what towards their crack addiction? You would hate it. Because it's killing well, you. Just said, you said that we hate it. Uh oh. You said hate. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Here's a question. It's really tough because, you, you know, when you have a friend or a loved one who's in that situation or a similar one, it's really hard to know what's the loving thing to do. Mm -hmm. You know? That's the thing. We're human beings, we have a very limited perspective. Now, that doesn't mean, that does not mean, we have no right to say 
Well, how can any of us really know what is right? Yeah. How can any of us really know if anyone's lifestyle is right or wrong? Now, we can never judge an intention, but we can sure as heck judge an outward action. Yes. And that is an unpopular opinion, what I'm just saying. Yes. Mm -hmm. But you can. Why? Because God actually told us what outward actions are not good. Yes. We have a standard, a clear yes. one. Now, here's a question. Hatred. Is hatred a negative thing? I don't think it has to be. Okay. Why not? I think it depends on what you hate. Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, you said, you know, God is a jealous God and... I think it's a Bible thing to say God would hate something that is destructive for us, and that doesn't make it like a negative thing or a negative part of his character, but he observes that something is destructive, and to despise that isn't necessarily like bad. Maybe. In Peril Andra by C.S. Lewis, there's a point when the character, the main character, comes in contact with a being that is completely pure, and not yet, basically an Eve character pre-temptation and he was there at the point where the devil essentially came and began to tempt this pure Eve essentially he was able to watch the fall happening on a different planet it's all weird stuff science fiction right sci-fi fantasy and he said uh, his interactions with this devil character uh, he said that he in, in witnessing the kind of wickedness that this, this creature was, existing for the sake of chaos and for the sake of destruction and nothing more, like taking pleasure in those things, he said that he understood the purpose of hatred for the first time in his life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He understood why hatred exists yes. as wow. an emotion. It wow. chills down my spine reading that. Wow. You have to read these books. The wow. Space Trilogy. It blew my mind. I'm almost positive that C.S. Lewis was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and understanding what happened during the fall in his description that he gave in Paralandra. That's my opinion. I really could be wrong, but that's one of the first things I'm going to ask God. Hey, will you actually <laughs> speak in C.S. Lewis during Paralandra? <laughs> I don't care about all these other things. <laughs> 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 no, no, I mean, Number one. here's the thing. I, you know, I read mere Christianity, and I, I disagree with like half of it. Hmm. Just do it. So I don't believe C.S. Lewis is infallible by any means. But Paralandra? <laughs> If there's a book that comes, <laughs> that felt like reading scripture, now that is super heretical. <laughs> I don't believe it's scripture. But it, the, way, the things he were describing either came from a, a mind with a level of imagination that I could never come close to, or it came from the Holy Spirit, one or the other. Either way, beyond my ability to fully grasp. Wow. wow. Anyway, he said he understood the purpose of hatred for the first time. Yes. So, yeah, <laughs> it's funny. I was preaching... Uh, I taught a message on the fact that God hates sin, mm -hmm. like a year ago. And uh, we had a visitor who hated it wow. and never came back. Oh, really? Because I talked about God hating. God hating anything. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, it's unpopular because love equals acceptance in modern culture. But the Bible doesn't give us room to say, well, God doesn't actually hate anything because it tells us. Explicitly. Uh, Psalm 45. Psalm 45, verse 7 says that God loves righteousness mm -hmm. and he hates wickedness. Yes. You don't get a whole lot more <laughs> clear than that, do you? No. God loves righteousness and he hates richness, uh, um, wickedness. Mm -hmm. Psalm chapter 7, verse 11 says that God is a righteous judge and he's a God that feels indignation every day because of the wickedness that we do here on earth. That we choose wickedness over him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, you find people who debate that. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't. God feels indignation. Mm -hmm. uh, Titus chapter 2. I'm talking about why Jesus came. It says that Jesus gave himself to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Jesus gave himself for that purpose, to redeem us from all wickedness. In other words, to pull us away from that thing. And in Matthew chapter 
uh, 1, verse 21, one of my favorite verses. It gives a kind of a mission statement of why Jesus Christ came to earth. And it said, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Hmm. What will he do? Save. He will save his people from their sins, away from their sins. I love that verse because you could, he, Matthew could have wrote a lot of things there. Matthew and the Holy Spirit speaking through him could have put a lot of things there. He will save his people from their confidence in their own ability to choose good. He will save his people. Here's a popular one. He will save his people from hell. He didn't say that, though. Did it? If it did, please correct me. But it didn't. He will save his people from their sins. Of all the things you think they put there, you think you put the one that God cares about the most. What does God want to save us from more than anything else? Sin. Why? Because he hates it. And so why did I bring this up? We talked about why do we talk about sin? Should we talk about it? Why should we care about it? At the very least, we know that God feels very strongly about it. That God uh, uses words like hate to describe how he feels about sin. Very strong language. And so at the very least, because God feels like this about it, we can't just simply ignore it. We can't. There's not a lot of things that the Bible describes God as caring about that strongly. And so if he cares about it that much, then we, we can't just stick it on the back burner. To a degree, it needs to be front and center. Now, I say to a degree because saving us from our sins is not the whole picture of the gospel. I think it's a core part of the gospel, but it's just one part. Yes. When you're talking about relationship with God, when you're talking about spreading the gospel to other people, saying it's only about saving us from sin makes it a very man-centric yeah. gospel. Yeah. It's not. But at the same time, it's not only God-centric. It's both. It's a mistake to say one or the other. You're talking about gospel on the far right, it's all about God, versus gospel on the far left, it's all about man. Mm-hmm. When in reality, God created man so they could be together. Mm-hmm. It's about both of them. Mm-hmm. From the very beginning, it's been about both of them. Mm-hmm. So, that's been fun. <laughs> from here on out, from here on out, everything we talk about is going to be contributing towards our own personal understanding of sin and is going to be helping us in formulating a definition of sin. Because what I'm going to try not to do is just give you guys a definition. Here's the thing. The Bible doesn't define it. It doesn't give us a here is sin and here is this and here is that. There's no chapter in the Bible giving us a doctrine of sin. Um, there are lots of verses that tell us about sin, but <laughs> some of the definitions appear to contradict themselves, almost. At the very least, giving different shades of the concept. So, in moving forward, we're going to be engaging in discussion, and this discussion is going to help us flesh out the idea of what it is to sin, of why God cares about sin, of what it means in general. But uh, we know God hates sin. From a biblical perspective, that's pretty clear. But what exactly is it? And there is no simple, simple answer. Really, I think there are probably three to four major aspects that need to be included and considered in any definition of sin. Because it's not as simple as the thing out to get you, or crossing a line you're never meant to cross. It's a little more complex than that. It is this. Uh, But... (laughs) Seeing that I have definitely not given you enough information to define it, I'm going to make you try to define it right now. So split into groups of, how many do we have? Eight? Split into groups of two. So the smallest possible group. And come up with a definition <laughs> of sin. In your own words. So we'll do like, 
I guess until everybody is comfortably done, but no more than 10 minutes. Once again, once again, come up with a definition of what sin is in your own words. It does not have to be correct or fully accurate because I we haven't talked about it enough for you guys to have all the information. We haven't looked at all of it. But in your own words, give a definition of what you believe sin is. Sorry, Sarah, you're, you're alone. I know. I should just have you answer
Okay, for those of you who are done, delegate a representative um, to write your answer on the board. <laughs> Unless it's really, really long. Say your own words. So that meant all the I have another all the question you writing utensil. Give me one second. It's in green. Green. I think you have a nice handwriting. I guess because this board is pretty tall, they're usually down there. It's better than mine. Look at that. You want? You want to explain it? Yes, she does. No, it's terrible. It used to oh, be no, that. What are you talking about? Look at that. Yeah, I know. Wow. It's beautiful. Mine's the best. That's like standards. Standards. No, you can't say it. It's not. Yours looks good, too. Oh, my gosh. All the yellow is better than mine. Okay. Oh, we only have three groups? Yeah, Four. What's the first group? I mean, I think it's better. I'll get mine. It's bad. It's bad. It's bad. Gosh, why do you keep these? I have no more. Yeah, well, buy me some new ones. Buy my ear. Gosh. Are we ready? Oh, sorry. All right, you got it all out of the way for me. Awesome. Look at that beautiful house. Look how nice that looks. <laughs> that body running is nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that the word? One self? 
Different answers. Just different aspects. Yes. Yes. Now they're totally different. But I don't think any of them are conflicting. So let's look at them really quick. Ideals we choose not to follow that have been set out. I think this one is actually pretty similar to this one. Because when you're talking about ideals, it's another term for God's standards, at least in, in some degree or another. Ideals that we choose. So, and over here we have the aspect of choice, uh, emphasized by Sarah, not to follow that had been set out by God. And over here, falling short of God's standard. So, God's standard, His own His laws, His directions, His commandments, falling short of that, missing the mark. That's the best uh, literal translation of one of the main words used to uh, represent sin in both the Old and New Testament. Well, they're different words, but. I love my hands. Uh, <laughs> we knew it came in. We knew it came in. It's a thing. It's a thing. It's a thing. Anything, <laughs> anything that violates our original design of relationship with God. So we're going back to original design. I think that's a, I think that's a neat way of looking at it. Yeah. Yes. Behavior or thoughts that are destructive to oneself or others. Yeah, I think this, you can tie this back into why there are standards. And why God doesn't want us violating that original design. So this sort of focus on the effects. This goes back to the origin. And these two focus on the clear explanation of how we are to live given to us by God. But I don't think any of them are wrong. No. But here's the thing. None of them are complete. Mm -hmm. In an understanding of sin, none of them are complete. Even if you were to combine all the aspects given here, none of them are fully there. But that is good. I'd be weirded out if you all answered everything perfectly. And I was just like, go home. <laughs> Why are you here? Wasting my time, right? I'm wasting my time, wasting your time. This is good. Okay, so was that helpful to sit down and at least uh, establish what you believe at this point in time to be the concept of sin? Was it? Yes. Yeah. It was helpful to see other people's as well. Yeah, you know. And I, I think as we move forward, I, I hopefully we'll all have a more fleshed out idea. But what's pretty unique to me is none of you guys are really wacky or off base. Mm. Often you'll sit in a room. If I were to pose that on a Sunday morning mm. and got everyone's answer, get some, weird, get some weird stuff. I can give you a weird answer. Sure. Oh, here. Give us a weird answer. Go for it. <laughs> it's this thing that is infected us and there's nothing we can do about it. There's a funny view of sin that says it's like a gremlin. It's like a little creature, and it's out to get you. Now, here's the thing. You can find scripture to support that idea. It's very difficult. God tells Cain, sin is crouching at your door. Yes. yes. So that is a personification, right? Mm -hmm. He's giving per traits of personality to sin. And you'll find other instances of that. So is sin a thing out to get us? I'm not going to tell you yet. We can look at it as we move forward. Maybe, sort of, maybe in one degree. Maybe it's actually an entity trying to get us or get in us or get us to Distract. do it. Or... But yeah, there's, there's some very uh, different views of sin. Some views that would be in total conflict mm -hmm. to what you guys are expressing up here. And we'll be looking at some different conceptions of the idea of sin uh, probably next week. But uh, let's, let's take another giant step back. We have a decent amount of time left. We take another big, big step back because I think when we're talking about sin, and uh, we've already touched on this a little bit, but I, I think it's important that we flesh out the idea. When we're talking about sin, I think it's very, very important 
that we take a hard look at what exactly God cares about in this whole ordeal. In other words, uh, we know how he feels about it. He hates it. But why does he feel that way exactly? Uh, what are God's motives? What are God's intentions for us in telling us what to do and getting angry with us and punishing us when we do sin? What, what is he trying to accomplish exactly? Why does he do things the way he does? And I don't think we can ever come to a full understanding of that. But the Bible does give us enough information to at least get a starting point or a general understanding of why God does what he does. Which is what, that's what the Bible is for. Mm. To give us an understanding, or at least some understanding of God. If it's not for that, there's not a whole lot of purposes left for it. It is a special revelation of himself and of truth and of reality as a whole. So God hates sin. And we've already got some uh, discussion on this, but the general consensus seems to be he hates it because uh, of its effects. He hates it because of what it is. Maybe he hates it because of what it does to us or to him or to the earth or whatever. Let's talk about the, the law for a moment here. The law. What is the law? How would you define it? We had some of the words used already, but standard. It's a standard yeah. yeah, I think standard is a really good way of putting it. Standard. In Romans and Galatians, you'll find verses in which Paul said, before the law, there wasn't really sin. Mm. Yeah, he didn't say it exactly like that. But he did say, he said, when the law was given, sin increased. One translation will say, the law was given in order that sin would increase. When another translation would say, the law was given with the result that sin increased. It's what you call the Hina clause in Greek. It means in order that or with the result that. And let me tell you something. Some of the most controversial verses in the entire Bible come from translating the Hina Clause one way or the other way. Almost in the New Testament, almost any time that you see the word that, like God came that this, blah, 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 that this would happen. It either means God did this for the purpose that this would happen, or God did this with the result that this happened. There's a huge difference between the law coming for the purpose of sin increasing wow. or the law coming with the result that sin increased. Wow. Hmm. Because on the one side, if God gave the law so that sin increased, and the law came for the purpose of sin becoming more widespread. Well, yes. Huh. Well, fault. He did it because he gave us the law. On the other side of things, God gave the law. And because there was now that standard, mankind was all the more aware of the fact that he was transgressing yes. over a standard yes. that was already there. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a difference. Yeah. 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 Now here's the thing. <laughs> You've got to figure it out. Mm. There is no, very clearly, he know ought to be translated this way in this section. You have to be able to understand the whole of scripture to look at specific verses like that and say, this is the one that I think it's actually saying. Mm. But there's no clues yeah. aside from that. Yeah. It could be one or the other. Wow. Welcome to the problem of Greek, ladies and gentlemen. Oh my. Any translation that you read that translates mm -hmm. one or the other has no other reason aside from their doctrinal opinion yes. to be translating that verse, that wow. word. Wow. Scary, huh? Yes, mm -hmm. it is scary. Learn wow. Greek. Mm. Wow. <laughs> 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 yeah. Don't worry about learning Greek. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Is there one translation that abuses that more oh, than most another? Or? Most of them. Since they're interchangeable, whatever the yeah, word is. Yeah, yeah, I guess it just depends on Even, the good, ones do. Even the good ones do. There is no translation that I can say, this one's perfect. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing, guys. If I were to give you a recommendation, mm -hmm. it would be because my doctrinal opinion lines up closer with the way they translated that section as opposed to another verse. Right. 
So you're looking at a biased opinion. Mm -hmm. There's nobody on this darn earth that is going to give you an unbiased opinion if they give you an opinion at all. Because every opinion is biased. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Snap back to reality. Oh, there goes gravity. Um, that's a quote from Eminem. In case you were looking for the book. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. This video's gonna get out. Pastor quotes Eminem. Pastor believes Eminem is a prophet. <laughs> He said it. Yeah. I'll start my own church. They're gonna, they're gonna say that. They're gonna, they're gonna take the quote. Eminem is a prophet. Eminem is a, Eminem is a prophet. Uh, I'm through. There we go. <laughs> yeah, that's a thing. So the law is a standard, and as far as what the standard exists for, well, open to interpretation. But at the very least, it's a standard. You ought to be doing this. Now, there are different opinions as to why God gave us a standard. But we'll get there in a second. <laughs> well, are there some other words you could use to describe what a law is? The law? God's law? Guidelines, maybe? Sure, and we're using synonyms. But I, synonyms exist for a reason. Yeah. To flesh out an idea, because yeah. they're not all the same word. They're shades of an idea. Guidelines. These are really good. Guidelines for what? <laughs> Guidelines for the law. Guidelines for living the original design. Okay, guidelines for living. Standards or guidelines for living, for life. Yeah. Now, once again, you'll find people who say the standard exists to show us we can never meet the standard. Yeah. Or you'll find people who say the standard exists to call us to actually live out the standard. Mm. One or the other. Mm. Any other words we can use here? Mm. Maybe we, we could probably stop there if we wanted to. Mm. Okay. Uh, what is it called when you disobey God's law? Sin? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, mm. that is a uh, pretty serious oversimplification of what sin is. However, It'll work to start off with. In general, when you take God's law, not the letter of the law, but the heart of the law. Now, as to what that is, that's open for debate as well. But the heart of the law is God's directions for our life. And if we disobey God's directions for our life, that is at least one aspect of what we call sin. At the very least, that's one aspect of it. Some of you guys said falling short of God's standard, crossing over the line, missing the mark, violating the guideline. At the very least, that's part of it. Now, once again, that is an oversimplification. That is not the full description of the law. It's more complicated than that. But uh, that, that, again, that'll work to start off with. Let's look at, let's look at very quickly three views of the law to the heart of it and the purpose of it. Mm, I'll do this up. View number one. We'll call this the arbitrary view. This is the view, and this is a pretty common view, especially among people who haven't really sat down to think about it. It's an idea within Christianity today, and really you see this a whole lot with like the kids, uh, teenagers, young people who were raised in Christian homes and were said, don't do this. Why? Because it's in the Bible. Because God told you so. Do it because I said so. Mm. It's the arbitrary view. It's a view that God's laws and commandments, that there's a degree of arbitrariness to them. That they exist. Okay, well, so why should I obey God's law? Because God said so. Okay. Why does he say so? Doesn't matter. He said so, so obey it. That's the end of the discussion. Now let's be fair here. There's a large degree of wisdom in the statement, do it because God said so. Isn't there? Mm -hmm. Is that ever bad advice? No. Is there ever a case in which you should not do a thing that God said to do, even if you don't understand it? 
I think that there's a case where there, there's a time and a place for doing something blindly simply because God says so. But I believe there's also a time and a place for understanding. Well, yeah. And I shouldn't just stop it arbitrarily. Well, this is where we stop so often. We never take it beyond the surface level. It's in the Bible, and therefore, it's right. The end. There was a uh, cartoon that I watched as a kid, and I still watch today, called SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> I love that cartoon. And there's an episode in which SpongeBob, the main character, he's in some kind of Olympic thing, and he's about to you know, go perform this Olympic vault or something. And his coach says, do this one for the Krusty Krab. That's the name of his restaurant he's, he's fighting for. And he goes, for the Krusty Krab! And he goes in and does a great job. And then the guy after him, and the coach says, do this one because I told you to. And he goes, because you told me to! And he vaults over and he hurts himself. That's the difference between arbitrary and everything after that. Why should you do this? Well, do this one for this reason. Or do it well, because I told you to. And that's it. Now, you know, again, I, I need to mention again that there's a degree of wisdom in the idea that we should do things because God, because God said so. But it doesn't end there. It doesn't stop it because he said so. Um, here's a fun question. <laughs> this might take up the rest of our time. That's okay. <laughs> Does it work like... You're talking about the law. Is it A, God's commandments are right because he says they are right, or B, God says his commandments are right because they are right. Hmm. I think the second one? I'll say it again in case I lost you. Are God's commandments right because he says they are right? Or does he say they are right because they are right? Okay. made reality, so it could be the first one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you think? Well, if it's the first one, then you're talking about the, then there is no free will or anything else. I mean, there's no actual reality. Reality is what God says it is. But when you say God says it is, it's because he's telling you the truth that it is. It's not that he's fooling us. I mean, that's my, you know, he's not trying to deceive me. Mm -hmm. I think you're saying it right, I, I think. So does that mean that the law is outside of God? Mm. So, here's, so here's, here's the quandary. Here's the quandary you face with this question. I've spent so many hours discussing this question, it's not even funny. <laughs> if you choose A, that God's commandments are right because he says so, God's commandments are, in the end, arbitrary. Because they're right, because he says so, and no other reason. In other words, God could have very easily, just as, or just as easily said, everybody should murder everybody. Mm. And that is the law. And it's right because he says it's right. Mm. If that is the reason it is right, then he could have made anything right. Yes. Right? Yes. Right? Yes. Now that seems weird. But maybe it's the way it is. Maybe. I was coming from the school of thought that there's some things that he says that really don't make sense to us. But that doesn't mean they're not right, but it's just in our way of thinking. Right. Like when he says forgive, that's a really tough one at times. Yeah, so here's the thing. The whole system of law, like love is what we should do. Is it that way because God just decided that it would be that way? No. Maybe. Because once again, if you say yes... He could have made anything right. He could have made it so stealing from each other would have been good. Murdering each other would have been good. But then he would now, have had to design the consequences of those actions to be different from what they are. Maybe not. What if the consequences as they are, are good? Hmm. Did he design <laughs> <laughs> Once again, this is why I say this is a quandary you face. Because yeah. it's well, at the very least, we can't go there. Yeah. We have minds that can reason within the boundaries of the reality we live in. Yeah. There's only so far we can go outside of that boundary before we stop. Mm -hmm. We don't have imagination that's powerful enough. Even the greatest science fiction books 
are all based on the foundations of the reality we live in as it is. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so here's the quandary you face with root, <laughs> root B. Now, I know we're going into some really you know, crazy stuff here. Yeah. But to be fair, I haven't gone into any, this. None of it's been weird up until this point. We're just getting into weird stuff now. And then we'll be gone after a second. Yeah, we're not going to cool. spend a lot of time here. But here's, here's the problem you face with, question, or with, uh, with path B. He says they're right because they are objectively right. Mm -hmm. If the laws are objectively right, whether God says they are or not, doesn't that mean the concept of law is, at least to some degree, independent of God? Here's a question. The Trinity, okay? Do you think the Trinity loves each other? Yeah. I think so. I think that's what makes them the Trinity. Yeah. Now, would it be wrong for the Trinity to be rude and mean and hurt and whatever else to each other? all the things that we consider to be wicked in relating with each other, would it be wrong for the Trinity to do that to each other? Yes. <laughs> now, that's, oh, that's a really difficult question. It is. is it rudeness if the other is not offended? <laughs> yes. <laughs> is it murder if it didn't really hurt? <laughs> it's okay, I was dead before I even noticed you were murdering. <laughs> I was sleeping when you strangled me. <laughs> you know, the ability to be different doesn't doesn't necessarily create a trait in and of itself. I mean, it's almost like a uh, just a philosophical play because it's like whether God says something is good, is He capable of lying to us and making us live in this illusion where murder is somehow good? And I mean, the definition of sin. That was put up there about harming yourself or harming others certainly restrains our reality of good and evil. You know, I mean, to call, um, you know, to call evil good and good evil, like suppose the end time stuff coming, right? That's contrary. I mean, God, I, 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 the concept is interesting, but I don't think that um, I don't think it, I don't think it matters on that. Can God? do this, it's like, God's not going to do it. It's, it's, <laughs> if he did it, well, he wouldn't be God. He would just be another entity playing with us, you know? And I don't, I don't see it. I mean, even with the free will part of the creationism, it's, it's tough. And, you know, I don't have the answer. I'm waiting until we get to the sin nature. I can't wait to <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm up with that sometimes, too. Yeah. We're going to be going into the Augustinian Pelagian controversy oh, wow. pretty soon here looking at the history of Augustine and why he held the views that he did and Pelagius and why he held the views that he did and then zoom forward a couple hundred years to a guy named John Cassian and why he held the views that he did and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, with the sin nature stuff, that is really important. Well, your earlier statement, when you were talking about the C.S. Lewis um, science fiction, I think you said it was, per oh, Perilous? Perilandro. Oh, Perilandro. Um, about the, this essence of uh, purity. Mm. And then temptation came, right? And, and that brought up a lot of that same type of thing about sin nature. What is it, our nature to yield to temptation, mm -hmm. or if you know if it's total purity without that um, flaw? I, I hate to say a flaw, but without that um, tendency to uh, or ability to choose sinful things, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So is it really a totally pure, or is that an accurate, you know, is that accurate, or is there oh, a, that's a big question. Is that carnal, or that thing That's a big inside? question. Was mankind made flawed from the beginning? If it's flawed, I mean, or is I, Well, it, is sin a flaw? Is sin wrong? It's a result of If we have a propensity to sin, to do something that God hates, How could he be mad at us? And once again, we are going into this stuff, but there's no way we can cover it all in 10 minutes, 30 yeah. minutes. Yeah. It's a complex subject, but it's an important subject. Yes? And here's a, a, just kind of a quirky thought I had. So part of my job is taking tech support phone calls, and it's really frustrating and difficult sometimes communicating with people and trying to help them understand what they're supposed to be doing to make these gadgets work the way they're supposed to work. 
my company designed these things, but at the same time, there are certain things that just we don't we don't have the technology. We can't make it better, faster, stronger. And so it's like, you know, people get really angry at me because they're like, well, but it's like I'm I'm just telling you how to make the device work. I'm telling you what you have to do to make it do its job. And if it's not doing its job, we'll get you a new one. But don't get mad at me because I can't make the thing work any different than the way it works. Mm. <laughs> now I will tell you this, Jim. When you're talking about at least the, the common views of sin nature. Mm -hmm. There is no major view that says God created us with a propensity to sin. In terms of a sin nature that makes it so we're bent towards sin, there's no view that says God created Adam and Eve with that leaning or the bent or even the causation to sin. All major views would say, not all major views, but the major views that would say we all have a causing thing in us that pushes us to sin. They would all say that came as a result of the fall. Hmm. But how could you fall if you didn't have the propensity to serve yourself? Well, that's the question. Well, well sorry, propensity I mean, to serve? If, 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 it's, if the sin is based on the lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and pride of life, right? I think that's scripturally yes. in Genesis there. That had, to be, that had to come from somewhere. So you're, and I, I'm just not understanding, I'm not defending it a lot. But it would seem to me that that was in place and Satan triggered it. Now, the purpose of why it was in place, why God does the thing he does, and I, you know, you know, maybe it's all so part of So what you're expressing, process. and this is by no means me saying don't even consider that, mm -hmm. but what you're expressing wouldn't line up with any of the at least common views. The common views would say there was God created man with complete freedom to choose whatever he wanted. Mm -hmm. And then Adam and Eve chose stupidly. Mm -hmm. And yes. their free, stupid choice twisted their nature. And now all of us are forced to. Now that is at least one of the major views. That would be the Augustinian mm -hmm. view. John Cassian and Pelagius would express very different views, which we get to go into. But uh, none of them that I know of. And if I don't know of it, that means it's uh, very, well, it, it means it's not very common. Mm -hmm would say that God created us with an inherent flaw. Mm. Now, many of them would say God created us knowing that we would bring a flaw upon ourselves. I wouldn't necessarily agree with that one. Mm. Or that God even predestined that we would do that. Mm. But at the very least, they would say that sin nature, or the idea of total depravity, mm. is a term you're referring, mm. referring to essentially, comes from the fall. Those are at least the common views. Well, how do you get from a, how do you get from a status of walking with God and not knowing good and evil? Mm -hmm. Where do you get to the status then of knowledge of knowing? If you if you don't know anything but goodness, right? You're walking hand in hand with God. Through okay. Well, see, so at the very least, what they were exposed to were it was there were no laws or standards except for one. Right. Don't do this. Right. right, And they were, the option to choose to do that was before them from the very beginning, but they knew God said, don't do it. Mm -hmm. Right. Then you had Satan show up. <laughs> you can get really complicated if you want to and say, is this literally what happened? Because, funny story, you go back and read Genesis, it is Hebrew poetry. Mm. It is not a, written in the form of a historical narrative. It's Hebrew poetry. So take for that one what you will. Just like Job is written in Hebrew poetry. I'd love to go into that someday. Job is one of my favorites. But once again, they had the option, uh, assuming they were created with the freedom to choose, they had the option before them to violate God's one single standard he put before them. Satan shows up, tempts them, gives them a reason to choose to do that. And once again, they were faced. This or this. If they were created with the freedom to choose, why couldn't they choose that? They could have. It seems to me they could have. But they did. And they did. What gets me is that there was apparently, from what I understand, many, many trees to pick from. They had one tree that they couldn't touch, and that was the one they wanted. Which is why, you know, it is obscene to think about the fact that it happened. Yeah. Yes. Which is why I think God treats it as obscene. Yeah. Are you serious? Really? Mm -hmm. Here for you. You really did. You really would. Really? Yeah, except we all do that every day. 
that, that, that account now, would fall here's, the here's the thing. Here, regardless of what you believe, our here and now is very different from what they faced then. In my opinion, they had a much easier choice in front of them than we do. All their influences, at least, were leaning towards do what's right. Yeah, and they just blew it somehow. We have a lot of influences pushing us towards wrong. That's true. But influence is not an excuse. Now, if it's a matter of cause, hmm. it seems to me that that would be a pretty good excuse. Hmm. I literally have no choice. Yeah. That's what we're talking about if we're talking about causative sin nature, total depravity. I literally can't choose anything but that. Hmm. But once again, we are stepping ahead of our bounds. Hmm. So, uh, in wrapping up for this evening, because I only looked at one opinion of the law here, and we've discussed a couple of them already. But the reason I posed that question about uh, why God gave his commandments, are his commandments right because he says so, or does he say so because they are right? There's one we can go into that, but I think it's not important that we have an answer. But I, I, I really think it's valuable to go in that direction occasionally. But I don't think God is so far off that we can't think about him in those terms ever. I do think it's unreasonable to say, I know all about it, oh God, I'm, I assume I've got the whole picture and yada, yada, yada. That is irresponsible and it's silly. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we need to be afraid of asking questions like that. No. I, have a, I, have a, I have an opinion. <laughs> a friend of mine, uh, when I was in Bible school, we had cleanup duty together after dinner. And every day for months we would discuss this question. And we finally hit a something that we said, it could be this. Mm -hmm. And we both agree, it, it, that makes sense. Um, maybe I'll mention it next week or something. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I won't be here next week. Great. <laughs> but we're, we're already out of, we're out of time. We have seven minutes. We're seven minutes over the, the, our time frame here. I don't want to keep you guys too late. I know, I know. Um, but yeah, I, I, once again, questions like that, they are theoretical. They're so theoretical. Um. <laughs> but what do you do if somebody has a view on that and comes to you and you haven't even thought about it? Well, that's on you. <laughs> you haven't even thought about that. That's on you. <laughs> yeah. Now, again, what's beneficial is at least you thought about it. Yes. Now we can say we have thought about it. Yes. I thought about it. It's hard because of this, this, and this. Yeah. Here's my opinion, maybe. Yeah. I once heard a crazy guy talking in a class, and here was his opinion. <laughs> 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 he quoted that in <laughs> That's good. I have never ever come close to quoting him in him before. I just ganged my head. I don't know. Maybe it was the Holy Spirit, guys. What do you think? What do you think? Yeah? Well, I honestly think I read an article about him recently saying that he had some kind of a near conversion, actual conversion. Yeah, I have no comment. I don't know anything about him. I just heard that song a few times. Okay. Um, yeah, if we have time next week, I'll, I'll, I can give those of you who are interested my theory. Is it going to be on tape? Okay, if you guys want to, we're gonna, we can end the class, and those of you who want to listen to it, I can give you my thoughts, okay? So, we're done. I'm going to close the, the tape.